Good evening, everyone. I am very delighted to be with you here this afternoon. I should say good afternoon, not evening. It's a privilege to be able to preach God's Word. Somewhere in her writings, Ella White informs us that angels would love to preach, but that privilege is not given to them. It is given to those for whom Jesus Christ shed his blood. And so I'm grateful to God for this privilege. I have been given two to three. I won't take the entire time, hopefully, but I want you to do me three favors before I begin. Favor number one, if you have a cell phone, I'd like you to turn it off. Now, don't put it on vibrate. I would like you to turn it off. Please grant this favor to a guest in your country. Turn the phones off completely. I'll tell you why. If it's on vibrate oh, and the phone vibrates, out of natural curiosity, you will look to see who's calling. And the person next to you will look to see what you're looking at. That's the way human beings are. So please, the world will not collapse if you do not know who's trying to call you for the next 40 minutes. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, I'd like you to pray for me. And all I want you to say is, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Based on Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And favor number three, I want you to think. Now, of the three favors, two are difficult. The two difficult ones are turn off your phones completely and think. But try to do that in the interest of a reverent worship atmosphere. Is that okay? What were the three favors I requested? Favor number one, turn off your cell phones. Has everyone turned off his cell phone until it is dead? All right. Favor number two, pray for me and you will say... Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. I mean that very seriously. Let me tell you why. It protects you from error. We have this treasure in what? Earthen vessels, that's me. Because I'm made of earth, dirt, clay, there's always the risk that the little dirt will emerge with the message. To prevent that, you pray and ask God to put his words in my mouth and because God hears the prayers that are according to his will God will answer your prayer and that way you protect yourself from error and of course the third favor is to think let us bow our heads now and pray our Father in heaven we come to listen to your word to think about your word to meditate on your word dear God and to allow your word to have its way in our hearts. I am asking you, Father, to remember the words that David spoke in 2 Samuel 23, 2, where he said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. Father, put your word in the very instrument of speech, my tongue, and open the eyes of your sons and daughters that they may perceive the truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There is a man in the Bible who is described this way. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. Let me repeat that description of a man in the Bible. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. When a man or a woman is described this way, what kind of life can you expect from that person? Give me one word responses. What kind of life should you expect from someone described by inspiration as a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith? Give me one word responses to describe the life of a person like that. That person should be... Righteous. That person should be holy. That person should be. What's that? Don't run out of, of responses. You just give me two. Righteous and holy. Think of the fruits of the Spirit. That person should be patient. That person should be loving. That person should be steadfast. That person should be immovable. Come on, somebody say amen. Are you good? 
Are you righteous? Are you full of the Holy Ghost? Are you full of faith? There is a man in the Bible who is described by Luke writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God as good, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. I'll tell you something else about this man. He was a very generous, unselfish man. When the early church began, not all those who were converted and baptized had material possessions to meet their needs. And the early church had a practice, the wealthy would sell houses and sell lands, and they would bring the money to the apostles, and the apostles would make distribution. This man, the Bible says, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. I repeat, there is a man in the Bible who is described as a good man, full of the Holy Ghost, and of faith. This man is singled out in the account in the book of Acts. And I won't give you what chapter yet. We're told the saints, as many as had lands and possessions, but he is singled out as having land, brought it, sold it, and brought the money, laid it at the apostles' feet. This man was a man of generosity. He was a man of courage. Because the Bible informs us, and when Paul was come to Jerusalem, he assayed or he attempted, he tried to join himself to the disciples, but they were afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple, Acts 9, 26. Because Paul had recently been converted. The disciples knew the kind of man he was. And so when he escaped from Damascus, because his life was on the line, and he came to seek fellowship with the disciples, those men of faith and courage, they were afraid of him because they were still functioning with the consciousness of his reputation, which was arrest people and have them killed. And so they would not receive Paul. The Bible says, but Barnabas, this is the good man, took him and brought him to the disciples and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to them and how he had spoken boldly in Damascus. In the name of Jesus, Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. He was a generous man. When he saw needy members in the early church, he sold land. And perhaps his land was so extensive that he is the only one identified by, well, there were two others, Ananias and Sapphira. He was identified as having sold his land, brought the money, Laid it at the apostles' feet. Acts 4 verse 37. He was a Levite. His name was actually Joses, but the disciples surnamed him Barnabas, which is being by interpretation son of consolation. He was from the country of Cyprus. When the disciples fled from Jerusalem after the death of um, Stephen, they went to Cyrene, to Cyprus, to Antioch, preaching the word, and many were converted. When the brethren at Jerusalem heard of the mighty works, they sent Barnabas to check, to make sure the theology was correct, that there were no shallow baptisms, and to confirm them in the truth. They sent someone who can trust, they can trust, to make sure that the basis of the conversion of these converts was truth. Barnabas. When some prophets came from Jerusalem, one of them called Agabus prophesied there would be a famine in the days of Claudius Caesar. The brethren of Antioch realized that the brothers of Jerusalem would be suffering. They collected some money and they gave it to two men to take to Jerusalem, Barnabas and Saul. And the order of the names is significant because in the early years, Barnabas was the preeminent disciple. Barnabas traveled with Saul. They preached together. Spent many, many months together preaching the gospel, confirming the brethren. At one point, the Bible says, now there was in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas mentioned first, Acts 13, verse 1. Barnabas mentioned first. And uh, Simeon, who was called uh, Lucius um, of Cyrene, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Barnabas is mentioned first. Then Lucius and Simeon and Manaean and Saul. Verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, 
the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work where I have called them. This man was called by the Holy Ghost by name. Now most of us are called by conviction. Am I right? We're called by conviction. Can you imagine what it is to hear the Holy Ghost call your name? Now this verse, Acts 32, is not in Revelation, so it's not symbolic. Are you with me? Are you with me? The Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul. Again, the order of the names is significant. At that stage, Barnabas was the mentor to Saul. Now, why am I saying that? My subject for this afternoon, good man gone bad. But not bad for long, let me say that quickly. Good man gone bad. Let's go to the book of Acts. Not Acts, sorry, Galatians chapter 2. Galatians 2, it is now 18 minutes after 2. Galatians 2. How many of you have Bibles? Raise them, let me see. Raise them high. Bibles, Bibles, Bibles. Hands down. Those of you without Bibles, raise your hands. You don't have a Bible. All right. We can fix that tonight. Just bring your Bible. We all make mistakes. Do you have Galatians? Do you have chapter 2? My brother's still looking for Galatians. He's found it. All right. Chapter 2. How many of you know the 66 books of the Bible in order? Raise your right hand. God bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. Was your hand up? Or were you thinking, God bless you? How many of you know the 27 of the New Testament in order? The 39 of the Old in order? Okay. I'll leave it at that and I'll go quickly to Galatians chapter 2. Reading from verse 11. This is uh, Luke writing about an incident that occurred between uh, Peter and Paul and he gives the reason for the confrontation. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Now, let's examine Peter's behavior which irritated Paul. Peter was a leading apostle. But Peter had a problem with people not of his ethnic group. And some of you have that problem perhaps right where you sit. And so when the Jews were not around, Peter would fellowship and fraternize with the Gentiles who had been baptized. When the Jews came, Peter acted as if the Gentiles did not exist. And Paul observed this behavior. But let's look at verse 13. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. What does dissemble mean? Give me a practical definition of dissemble. Look at what was happening. When the Jews were not around, Peter fraternized with the Gentiles. When the Jews came, he acted as if the Gentiles did not exist. What do you think dissemble means? To act how? Insincerely. And to be fairly harsh, to act hypocritically. And the rest of the Jews dissembled likewise with him. What does that mean, likewise with him? The same thing, but there's another element that you're not saying. Who was Peter? He was the leader of the early church. A powerful leader, someone who raised a dead woman from the grave, where from death. The other Jews observed Peter's behavior. And the Bible says they followed him. They dissembled likewise. What's the next word? And the Jews dissembled likewise with him. What's the next word? In so much. What does that mean? You know, there's, there, there, there's a passage in, in um, Matthew chapter 12 from verse 22. The Bible says, And then there was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him in so much. That the blind and dumb both spake and saw. What do you understand by in so much? Give me a synonym phrase for in so much. To such, to such, English must not be your native language, to such an extent, to such a degree, or it was so bad. 
It was so bad. The dissembling of Peter and the Jews. Now you finish verse 13. That finish verse 13. Read it out loud if you have the King James Version. In so much that Barnabas. Now, think of who Barnabas was and then think of in so much. Are you listening to me? What's our subject? Good man, gone bad. But put in, in brackets for a short time. Don't leave this place thinking Barnabas was a, is headed for hell. He is not. He made the kingdom occupying a preeminent position. But for that time. But I want you to see what caused a man of Barnabas' spiritual stature described in Acts 11.24. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. Now how do you get a man like that? Described that way by the Holy Ghost. To act in such a shameful way. He followed. Finish what I want to say. He followed the crowd. When you told your parents you wanted to come to a AUP, did some of them object that you shouldn't leave home yet? Or when you say you want to move out, do your parents object a little bit? You know why they object? I'll give you one reason. Well, I won't give you a reason directly. I'll ask you a question, then you can divine the reason. Can your parents trust you to live by the principles by which they brought you up? Don't answer me. Let me make some guesses that are probably have some fact. You were accustomed to worship morning and evening in your homes. Your parents thought of it that you read the Bible. You read Ellen White. You came home a certain time at night. Question, don't answer me. Are those principles under attack because of the influence of your friends on this campus? In so much that if your parents were to come quietly and observe you, they would not recognize you as the child they raised. In so much don't be misled into thinking because you're on a Christian campus, all is well and all is safe. John 6, 70, Jesus says, have I not chosen you twelve? And one of you is what? A devil. Wherever there are God's people, Satan's people are present. Look at your behavior. Are you being carried away? As Barnabas was. Now to carry away Barnabas, that tide of hypocrisy had to have been some kind of tsunami. You don't wash away a man like Barnabas. But it's a lesson for us because none of us would describe ourselves where we are now in the pew or in the pulpit as full of the Holy Ghost, full of faith and good men and women. We dare not describe ourselves that way. So if he could be swept away, a man who mentored Paul. You have a boyfriend or a girlfriend? How do you behave on Saturday nights? <laughs> now in your heart you want to behave properly, but you look around and you see the others behaving a certain way and it is, it is contrary to human nature to be too different. And so you fit in. In so much... Even the Holy Ghost has problems recognizing you as a child of God. Good man, gone bad for a short time. Paul must be commended and complimented. It was apparent that all the Jews, led by Peter, seconded by Barnabas, went off in one direction. Now, understand something about Barnabas. Barnabas had confronted a crowd going in the wrong direction before. Because in Acts chapter 9, verse 26, the Bible says, And when Paul or Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed or attempted to join himself to the disciples, but they were afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him. In other words, Barnabas took a stand against all the disciples. Are you following me? Why don't you answer me? Are you following me? 
Look as though you're sleeping with your eyes open. <laughs> Barnabas took a stand against all the disciples, men of God. He said, no, 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 we have to accept this man. And Barnabas not only took him and brought him, but he testified to the genuineness of the man's conversion and told them, declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and he had spoken unto him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus, Acts 9, 27. This was a man who had probably been accustomed taking stands. Now, he confronts this situation. Who knows what the operating forces were? He did not want to look bad in front of all the Jewish leaders. Probably had high regard for Peter. And he probably reasoned, if Peter could drift, I can drift. If the principal of the university can be seen in a bar, I can go to a bar. If my English department head can be caught in a cigarette, what about me and I'm just doing English 101? If the church pastor can have a girlfriend beside his wife, then why can't I have two boyfriends? The Bible tells us very directly. It's not a suggestion, it's a command. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Peter could have led those people along the path of damnation and destruction. Now, of course, we know Peter repented. We know that. Peter repented. So did Barnabas. They must have. They could have led those people on a path to soul destruction. Because you never know. Once you influence someone to take one wrong step, there is no guarantee the person will step back. There are women who are prostitutes today because they were sexually abused once. Are you listening to me? There are people in the third and fourth rehabilitation program because they took one hit of a piece of marijuana a millimeter long. So when you argue, well, it's Saturday night, I am just going a hundred yards from the gate. Well, Adam did not leave Eden. You and I must be careful how we behave. Not only, not only must we preserve our integrity for the sake of our own souls, but understand, according to the book, um, Ellen White tells us, that God holds us responsible for the influence we exert on others. In other words, if someone goes to hell because of you, you have to pay. Did you hear me? There's a story in the Bible where three accounts, they virtually the same thing. Twice involving Abraham, once involving Isaac. And uh, Abraham's account is found in Genesis 12, Genesis 20, Isaac's in Genesis 26. And we won't go there, I'll just give you the details, I want to let you go early. Abraham came to Egypt because of a famine. Well, says that when Abraham was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians saw the woman that she was very fair. The princess also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Genesis 12, verse 16. And verse 17, verse 17 tells us, 16 and 17 tell us that he gave Abraham all kinds of gifts. Verse 17 says, But the Lord plagued Pharaoh's house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. And Pharaoh called Abraham. Now, read the question that Pharaoh asks Abraham. What is this that thou hast done to me? Am I on video? I am? Okay, I won't move. Listen to me. How many of you are Seventh-day Adventists? Raise your hand. You're Seventh-day Adventists. Raise your hands. All right. Okay, hands down. You're not a Seventh-day Adventist, raise your hand. Okay. Abraham was a Seventh-day Adventist. Do you know Jesus was a Seventh-day Adventist? You know that? Medical Ministry, page 49, paragraph 4. Ellen White says, Christ was a Seventh-day Adventist to all intents and purposes. Come on, say amen. amen. She didn't say he was a Baptist. God bless all Baptists. 
inspiration tells us Jesus was a Seventh-day Adventist to all intents and purposes. Now, since Abraham is his spiritual father, then Abraham was a Seventh-day Adventist. Reasoning spiritually, but not logically, necessarily. Now, here's Abraham, the SDA. Now, here's Pharaoh. What would we call him? You, the, are you all Adventists? But this may go all over the world, so let me stop. Here's Pharaoh, a, a, a heathen. Let me not identify the heathen. A heathen, a pagan. The, the, the Egyptians worship the, the, the cow, they worship the hawk, they worship the hyena, they worship the cat, they worship the dog, they worship anything and everything that moves. Now, this was Pharaoh. Now, here's what we have as we continue good man gone bad. Here is the believer who must set an example. When Jesus said, "Ye are the light of the world, it did not just apply in the New Testament time. That should have been the way it was from way back. Here is the unbeliever. And here is the Adventist Abraham. And the unbeliever looks at the Adventist and says, why are you trying to destroy me? What is it thou hast done unto me? You know, Barnabas could have asked that of uh, Peter. The Jews who followed Peter could have asked Peter the same thing. What are you trying to do to me by the power of your example? Listen to me. God made two adults. Everyone else comes as a baby, including Jesus. Are you following me? Let me say it again. God made two adults. And they were not a boy and a girl. There were a man and a woman. This is a digression, but I have to say it. And he put a man and a woman together romantically. He didn't put a boy and a girl. You're not listening. God put a man and a woman. He did not unite a boy and a girl. Now, let me go back to influence. Leave this boy and girl stuff alone. God made two adults. He could have made eight million adults or eight billion. He could have done that immediately. But God arranged that everyone else would come into the world shaped and influenced by others. Are you listening to me? This influence is even biologically transmitted. Attitudes and habits and states of mind are passed on. And so, while you may be saying, well, I don't influence anyone physically, visually, but by your selfishness, by your negativity, you, may, you who are planning to have a child, when that child comes to years and recognizes the kind of mother you are, or father, the child may say, as Pharaoh said to Abraham, what is this you have done to me? By passing on to me your selfishness, your negative. Ellen White says, we parents pass on attitudes. I told you, God, Ellen White tells us, God holds us responsible for the influence we exert on others. I think it's historical sketches, page 143, paragraph 5. We're all woven together in the great web of humanity, and God holds us responsible for the influence we exert over others. My brothers and sisters, what am I trying to say, or have been trying since five after two? You must make a decision to stand upright on this campus, in your homes, in your communities, wherever you go. You won't always have a dean and security at the gate with guns. Or your friend who seems to be upright, and because of that friend's uprightness, you walk upright as long as you're covered in the person's shadow. When you step out on your own, you must have the moral courage to stand up for what is right. And the second part of this sermon will be sometime this week. What I'm telling you now is not what I'd intended to say. But what I have to say, I was advised, may be better said to a larger group, including this. Watch your influence. 
and do not allow other people's influence to change your behavior unless it is the influence of a godly person. So if your roommate reads the Bible, submit to that influence. If your roommate is patient and kind and thoughtful, let that affect your behavior. But if your roommate loves to sneak in late, you need to get out of that environment. If your roommate has no respect for young ladies and has plans that will take him to hell, you need to get out of that influence or try to change it quickly before it changes you. When the Israelites were coming into Canaan, God told them, don't fraternize, don't marry, don't intermingle with the, the Amorites or the Canaanites. And God gave the reason, they will take you from me. God never said, you will bring them to me. Let me say it again differently. It seems easier... For the carnal to attract its way than for the spiritual to attract its way. Because we're not naturally spiritual. We're naturally carnal. There's a reason why most people go to hell. Few go to heaven compared to those that go to hell. Are you listening to me? You must watch your influence on this campus. Question again at uh, 20 minutes to something. You have friends. Listen to me carefully. You have friends. Are your friends better off spiritually because you are? <laughs> now, you'll notice I mention boyfriend, girlfriend often because when people at this age get together, well, any age, that's usually all that goes on. So no point pretending it doesn't happen. You're sitting in class, introduction to the New Testament theology, and your eye is on everyone except the teacher. That's not necessarily a sin because God made us that way. What I'm saying is your influence, your influence has to be watched. The very way you dress. All of me. I was in England preaching a few year, uh, last year and then this man took me around, very nice fellow, Bible worker. He had two little boys. The little boy, one of them would go home and jump him in a chair and he started preaching. And uh, the father wrote me, he said, Pastor, this son of mine, he prays for you, and he sets up a little pulpit in uh, some part of the home. The father told me this. And he preaches. So I asked him why. He said, well, Pastor, just keep preaching. And he's about, he's only five. And he said, and Jesus has come. The father said, why do you shout? He said, Pastor, just shouts. <laughs> so while it sounded funny, it sobered me up. Because that boy could have seen me doing something else. Are you listening to me? Do you have the strength to honor God even if you're the only person on the campus who does that? Now the Bible says it is not good that man should be alone. So there is built into us a need, a desire, an urge to be socially supported. And there's nothing sinful about that. But if necessary, can you stand alone? Jesus did. Hebrews 1 verse 3, when he had by himself purged our sins. All the disciples forsook him and fled. What did he cry out to the Father in Mark 15 34? My God, my God, finish it for me. Why hast thou forsaken me? What am I saying? The Father left him for a while. So the Holy Ghost must have left him. Because the Holy Ghost can't act contrary to the Father. The angels must have left him for a while. The disciples forsook him. Jesus was on that cross alone. And he stayed. Question. Can you stand alone? Or are you like so many others, a spiritual coward? Influence is a powerful thing. The ability to resist the tides of immorality. The tide of just nominalism. You know what nominalism is? Come to church, go home. Come to church, go home. Come to church, go home. Wave up the Bible. Come to church, go home. Wave up the Bible and that's it. Question. Let me close this Bible so you know I'm coming to an end. How many of you can play a piano? Raise your hand. 
How many of you can play anything? How many of you have ever tried to learn to play anything? How many of you can explain righteousness by faith? How many of you could defend the doctrines of the church before a court of law? A court of law. At what age do you hope to get before you can do that? 40? 50? 29? How old was Christ when he defended the teachings of his father before an assembled host of doctors? All 12 year olds raise your right hand. Then what's the problem? Are you influenced to be lazy by someone? Are you influenced by that teaches you nothing and so you study nothing? Is your circle of friends totally without any interest in biblical things? Why are you? You know, Dr. Pippen spoke this morning at uh, that other school. What? Yes, that one. Why are you here? My question to you would be, and I'm saying many things in a few minutes left, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Why not become a Pentecostal? Why not be a Baptist? They don't bother about Sabbath. They leave the church and go to the racetrack. They leave the church and go to the casino. They leave the church and go to the soccer stadium. They leave the church and go to the bar. They leave the church and go to the whorehouse, and there's no church discipline because it's okay. They leave the church and go to common law, husband or wife, no problem. They don't come to church for nine months, no problem. No offering, no tithe, no problem. Why be a part of a church that checks you and calls for moral behavior? Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? And if you don't know, chances are your influence will be more harmful than helpful. And God will hold us accountable. My brothers and sisters, let me close by saying, make sure as...